Okay, um, I think we'll go ahead and get get started. And as people, you know, join in the waiting room, I'll let them in. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Melinda Rosenthal, the Director of Student Services at the headquarters here in Indian Indianapolis. And um, I'm also the staff person that is the liaison to uh, the Judiciary Committee. And something that's been uh, worked on for over a year now is um, the Code of Conduct. And um, we are presenting that tonight. And I'm so happy to um, introduce um, our Judiciary Chair, Christian Nuccio. And um, before Christian starts, I also would like to thank uh, Thomas Tran, our fraternity president is here. and. Um, other staff members, other volunteers. So thank you for all your time. And also Don uh, Sheckler, our board uh, member who is our um, board liaison to the Judiciary Committee. So thank you for everyone attending and everyone um, here with their time. So Christian, I'll, I'll put it over to you. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Christian Nuccio. Can someone, Thomas, can you give me a thumbs up? You can hear me. Excellent. Well, I'm Christian Nuccio. I'm the chair of Elf Kappa Psi's Judiciary Committee. Today, we're going to give uh, a quick overview of a new document the fraternity has present, uh, created, which is called the Code of Conduct. Before we start, uh, just very quickly, and if you'll go to the next slide, Melinda, I'll uh, discuss what the Judiciary Committee is so everybody's aware. Um, the, oh, it's a big picture of me. Uh, so the fraternity is uh, broken out into separate teams that help manage all the things that happen inside the organization up at the, uh, the national level or the international level. The board of directors really controls the entire organization. Um, and underneath the board of directors, they have a committee called the Judiciary Committee. Uh, and our tasks are to do two things. They're to review and uh, help update policies when it comes to risk management. And they're also to conduct investigations and advise chapters and regional directors who are conducting investigations into disciplinary matters um, and ultimately recommend discipline for those matters. So we kind of fall into two camps, the conduct camp and the disciplinary camp. And you'll see the code of conduct that we have uh, kind of replicates both of, those, both of those areas. So today, uh, during our conversation, I'm going to go through kind of what Alpha Kappa Psi is trying to do and how the code of conduct fits into that. Um, and then we're going to go through quickly the code of conduct and uh, and then the implementation plan at the end. Before we start, just a quick caveat. Um, a lot of the disciplinary matters that are happening down at the chapter level or across the fraternity, um, if they're ongoing matters, we generally don't discuss them in public forums. So uh, if you have questions related to those matters, uh, it would be best to either send me a private message now uh, or to send me an email and we can discuss those offline. Um, also, when it comes to hypotheticals, those can get us kind of in a dicey situation. So if you do have a question and you have a hypothetical, please feel free to pose it. And I will absolutely do my best to work around it and make sure that we're answering uh, kind of the crux of the, the question that you have. So um, I'm going to feel skip forward. This next slide here is going to kind of talk about our organizational focus. So the goal of the organization is really founded about around these core values. Um, and what we're trying to do is develop principal business leaders, which we're all aware of. Um, but the code of conduct, the idea is to create a document or create um, some standards that help us understand as members what we are expected to do. In the past, a lot of what we had uh, was this term called risk management policies. Risk management policies, they would cover five main topics, which were alcohol and drug, hazing, fire and safety concerns, publication of inappropriate materials and sexual misconduct. Um, but those five kind of topical areas, those don't really encompass everything that it means to be a brother. And it really lives out, leaves out this big part of just general conduct, how we should be acting. And so what the code of conduct is, did is it brought in those five risk management policies under a general umbrella of conduct. Um, and it's important to say now that we as a fraternity no longer use the term risk management policies. Everything that we do falls underneath conduct, whether it is misconduct when it comes to hazing, misconduct when it comes to 
alcohol or misconduct when it comes to general conduct inside the organization. I mean, that's a shift that we'll be doing. And you know, I'll certainly ask the leaders of our organization um, at both the student and the volunteer level to help shift uh, the language that we use there. So this next slide here is gonna show you exactly what the code of conduct is. It's split into those two pieces like I talked about earlier. The conduct policies, which have been either created or adapted to other policies that we had. And then the disciplinary procedures, which I'll briefly go over, but previously this document used to be called the Judiciary Committee Operations Manual. Um, on this next slide here, you'll see what the conduct policies are broken down into. And I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes on this slide so we're all generally aware of, uh, of this because this is really critical to, especially the chapter leaders on the call, understanding the direction that the fraternity is moving into, but more specifically, the rules that you can use as a chapter leader when you identify misconduct inside your organization, how you can adapt to it. So on the left, you'll see that general conduct is kind of the main and the first section of this document. Um, later, we'll go into detail, but it's broken out into three parts. It's broken out into a part that discusses every member of our organization. And then the management team helped us design a specific language that's gonna be used for volunteers and for alumni. Now, for the students on this call, the volunteer piece won't necessarily pertain to you, but that alumni piece will pertain to you because these are policies that we've put in place to make sure that student chapter rules are respected by alumni when student chapters are conducting events. And then you'll see some of the other policies that the fraternity either had or revised and added in there. Um, the ones in kind of that off yellow, those are ones that we've made major changes to. Um, but I'm gonna go through all six very quickly just because I know not everybody has a common understanding of what the policies are, uh, just to bring everybody on the same page. So when it comes to the alcohol and drug policy, it's important for all students to understand that the fraternity allows alcohol at chapter events. There are a lot of chapters that are not aware of that. Um, we have some rules that need to go into using alcohol at chapter events, but those rules are generally pretty easy to follow and they're intended to help facilitate alcohol use, not restrict it. And so, uh, I really encourage chapters, if you're having events or what some chapters refer to as like unofficial events, um, it is very easy to take whatever event you have that has alcohol and slightly modify it. And it will generally meet the, the standards of our fraternity. Where a lot of chapters get themselves in trouble is they host an event with alcohol, they don't read these policies and they violate one of the rules inside there. Um, the next piece is hazing. Uh, we did a major overhaul to the language inside the hazing document to conform with national standards of uh, what constitutes hazing. Um, the national standard is actually looser than Alpha Kappa size policies. So we had to change some verbiage to meet it. And then we added in these other pieces that specifically pertain either to our organization or to professional business organizations. Uh, fire and health safety. Uh, we added in a piece about firearms and explosives in there that wasn't previously added. We haven't had an issue with that inside the organization, but we work closely with an insurance company that recommended we add that in there. Uh, for publication of inappropriate materials. So we've done a major overhaul on this in the past and that's now reflected here. Uh, it's important for chapters to understand that the fraternity does regular policing of our social media to make sure that things that are tagged with Alpha Kappa Psi's name are representing our, our values. If they don't, Typically what happens is a member from Alpha Kappa Psi's staff will reach out to the chapter and ask them to take it down. And 99% of the time we achieve compliance there. If we don't, we have some struggles with that. The Judiciary Committee will, will generally get involved to make sure that we can either bring things into compliance or help ex get a better understanding of what's going on inside those posts. Um, and the last two I'll quickly cover, uh, the sexual misconduct policy. Uh, this has seen a major revision, uh, mostly because um, over the past year, especially with the isolation when it comes to COVID-19 and the um, kind of uh, Me Too movement and um, explosion of social media, we are seeing a lot of either chapters or members that will post allegations of sexual misconduct publicly. And those have to be handled kind of delicately is not the right word, but appropriately to make sure that if discipline is necessary, either by the university or by the police, we're doing the right thing to conform to those legal or university standards. 
And so we've modified this policy to help better explain our expectations when allegations are reported of how they need to be reported. And then the actions that the fraternity um, or the, I should clarify, the bodies that the fraternity considers adjudicators for these matters. Um, each allegation of sexual misconduct has to be handled uh, very differently and uniquely. And it is very different from all the other conduct issues that the organization sees. So I strongly encourage every person on this call, if you get an allegation of sexual misconduct, the first thing you should do is reach out to the fraternity headquarters, uh, either through one of your volunteers on the management team to the judiciary committee or to the fraternity staff. Um, that first call should be there because typically we have kind of a response we can work through to let you know what these next steps are. I, I strongly encourage chapters, do not conduct disciplinary hearings on sexual misconduct allegations without contacting the fraternity first. You should not be doing that. Um, these require some training and delicate handling that uh, student members and frankly, I don't even have uh, to do. So we, we need to get specialists involved there. And then this last piece, the scavenger hunt, uh, is just a quick reminder to everybody that uh, prior to conducting scavenger hunts, a request does need to be uh, sent up to the fraternity so that we can approve this. So one slide, a whole bunch of talking. This is really to kind of get everybody on the same page. It's, it's important to understand those pieces. It's probably more important to understand the structure of this document. Uh, and as we move to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about general conduct. So uh, I'll quickly move through these. My, my goal here is while I like to think that everybody will read the code of conduct policy, I'm also realistic in that it probably falls below all the schoolwork a lot of our members are doing. So I wanna make sure we get the bottom line up front on a lot of these pieces so everybody's on the same page. Um, so these general conduct policies pertain to every single member, regardless of your status, if you're an alumni, if you're a volunteer, if you're a student, if you're a pledge, they all are gonna apply uh, universally. So this first one, this is a big one for chapters because uh, this is probably the biggest conduct violation we see, which is engaging in conduct that embarrasses our organization or calls into question its integrity, honor, reputation. Uh, a great example of this. Every year, probably three, we get three to four allegations of pledges cheating on the fraternity exam. Prior to the code of conduct being published, there wasn't necessarily a rule that said you couldn't cheat on the fraternity exam. I mean, it's not allowed. And we had some policies in place that said we can remove you for gross and proper conduct, but it was hard to root down to exactly where conduct was governed when it came to things like integrity. So this is where this falls in here. And, and I'm sure a lot of the people on this call can think of other times where pledges or brothers have acted, you know, the term I would use is inappropriately, but we haven't really been able to say, you know, this is what you were doing that was wrong. And this is kind of that, that first piece. And the fraternity made a deliberate decision to make this the first point of our policies. Our expectations are that as members, you represent our organization and you're conducting yourself in a way at all times that represents our organization. Um, we'll move to the next one. So this next one uh, talks about uh, conducting things fairly and impartially. So a lot of times this pertains to disciplinary hearings uh, or uh, general discrimination inside chapters and following university policies, governing documents. And then this one at the bottom is very important, just directors, directives from fraternity leaders. So this helps better clarify when the region, regional director is interacting with chapters that they're allowed to give direction to those chapters to say you either can or cannot do something. And a lot of times this comes into play with um, when a chapter is doing something and the fraternity becomes aware that it may be violating some sort of policy, we can direct the chapter, hey, don't conduct this yet. Let us you know, get a better idea of what's happening before we move forward. Uh, and then this next um, bullet. Uh, so paying all outstanding bills and invoices, which generally we do, but the second piece is more important, which is care for all property or facilities rented, leased, or borrowed. I would say about once a year, we have a chapter that will um, rent a house or something like that and trash it completely. And they'll be billed for it and pay that bill. Um, but it's, you know, we add that second piece in that you still have to care for those facilities because that really ties back to our name. Next bullet. Uh, refrain from abusing or interfering with the fraternity's 
uh, conduct and disciplinary process. I know there are a couple of people on the call who have already dealt with this, but this works all the way down to the membership level. So as a chapter leader, when you're dealing with members who are part of your disciplinary process that are doing things like frequent reschedulings of a disciplinary hearing so that you can never actually sit down with them to get the process over with, this is now part of our policy that that's considered misconduct. And that's kind of aimed to help these chapters out when we are going through those disciplinary processes. And then uh, this last bullet here is exercising fiduciary care and responsibility for funds and assets. So again, typically a few times a year, we will deal with chapters where the vice president of finance or whoever it is will embezzle money from the chapter using the debit card to buy things on their own. Um, and so this is the kind of piece we can tie back to to, to work through the conduct uh, and discipline process with that. So before I move any further, I, I wanna pause here and make sure if anybody has any questions, I can answer those questions because this is the bulk of what chapters will deal with when it comes to misconduct. Hi there, uh, Brother Williams here uh, from the LA Los Angeles alumni chapter. Does a lot of the code of conduct apply to the alumni chapters as well? I know it's a lot different from collegiate versus uh, alumni. Yeah, great question, Craig. So the policies work with individuals. So um, and the, so yes, this this policy pertains to every single member, and regardless of not only your status but what part of the organization you're in. So if you're an alumni member, this will still pertain to you as as a member of our organization. Other questions? Bless you, Alyssa. Okay, if we have no more questions, uh, we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so alumni policies, uh, chapter members, student chapter members, this is very important for you to pay attention because we have added these in uh, at a specific request from a number of chapters. So these are policies that pertain to alumni that chapters are expected to report to the fraternity if they're not being followed, so the fraternity can enforce them. This first one is following all requirements outlined by student chapters when alumni are attending your events. This means if you're hosting a dry event and an alumni shows up drunk, you need to report that to our organization so we can take action. This means that if you are hosting um, an event that is members only and alumni bring non-members, uh, that needs, you know, it, I'm not saying it needs to be reported, I'm saying if you want it to be taken care of, you now have the capability to report it to us so we can take care of it. Um, and then similarly, uh, there are events that you will host that will be members only, and yet alumni will still show up to them. So we would ask that those be reported up to us so we can handle them appropriately. And then this next one down here kind of gives you some authority. So this allows the chapter to request that alumni not attend one of your events. So the, the way we do this is you, in writing, notify the alumni that you know, you'll be conducting an event on this day and you would ask that they not attend that event. And then you'll CC your regional director inside of there. Um, and so this is an authority we're pushing down because as volunteers and as members of the fraternity staff and at the kind of international level, we don't know what's going on inside your chapter. We don't know who is messing with the general operations of your organization, but you do. And so you now have this authority to do that. Um, I imagine that these are going to get sticky over the next two years, and that's fine. We understand the spirit and intent of what we're trying to do, and we can work with your chapter to make sure we're meeting that spirit and that intent. Um, great question, Alex. So Alex's question was, um, and turn in two. So uh, yeah, so just generally, um, let's talk about uh, alumni discipline and removal. So. If an alumni violates one of our conduct policies, they are governed by the fraternity at large. So the Judiciary Committee will handle their discipline and removal. That means that chapters don't have the capability to do it. There is an exception, and that exce exception is that, um, and I, I'm gonna caveat this, right? To my knowledge, because um, I, I might be incorrect here, but to my knowledge, alumni chapters still have the capability to hold disciplinary hearings. Um, so let's, for the alumni in this room, uh, let's put that kind of on the side and I'll, I'll get better clarification. But for now, my understanding is you all can hold your own disciplinary hearings for your members. For the student members specifically, 
if an alumni does something wrong, the fraternity will handle it. And not only is that a requirement, but we also do it because we know that the chapter probably doesn't want to get into a duel with alumni. So we work with your chapter individually to make sure that we're publicizing that correctly. So if the chapter wants that publicized to all the alumni to say, hey, we, you know, we just work with the fraternity to kick this guy out. And we want you to know that if you mess up, you're going to get kicked out too. We can do that. Or if the chapter wants to say, hey, we had nothing to do with this. And this is the big bad fraternity coming in. We can do that too. You know, whatever's supporting the, the, your chapter's kind of initiatives and goals, we can help out with. Um, and those, obviously, those things can scale. It's a little harder with alumni, but we can do things from preventing them from coming to events for a longer period, all the way up to expelling them from membership. Any other questions on this? Okay, we'll move to the next one. If you do, just go ahead and type them in. Okay, let me, sorry, one more question real quick from Jacob. Um, yeah, so that is a, that is a great question. Um, and again, um, I am constantly encouraged that uh, people read our policies and can identify these kind of like weak points. So this most certainly is a weak point. Um, if your chapter, uh, your chapter can request that alumni not attend events. The reason why you have to CC a regional director in there is because what your chapter can't do is tell your chapter advisor that they can't come to certain events. Um, or a member of the fraternity staff that they can't come to certain events. So um, that that is not a loophole, but it appears as a loophole. And that's really why we need the regional director involved in these things. So this last piece, I'm gonna go, um, Melinda, would you mind clicking through these so we can just show them all at once? So these last ones are volunteer uh, highlights. It's important to know that there are more policies than are listed up here. I think there might be one more on the slide, Melinda. Um, there are more policies than the ones that we see up here. I'm going to very quickly run through them only so that A, the volunteers understand that are on the call understand what we're talking about, but more specifically B, so the students also understand the expectation we have for these volunteers. So this top one here, when it talks about maintaining personal relationship, professional relationship and distance, uh, in a volunteer's capacity as employed by our organization, employed is not the right word, in, our, in a volunteer's capacity when they work with our organization, our expectation is that they're doing work on behalf of the fraternity. And so if they are at a chapter event as your regional director, they're representing our organization. And that means that they need to maintain professionalism, but also any advice they provide or actions they conduct, those are on behalf of the fraternity. Um, and so that's why we govern their conduct when they're doing these things. Um, the second one over here really pertains down to chapters when it comes to purchasing or contracting. So uh, if your chapter is looking to get flyers for an upcoming event and your regional director says, hey, um, you have to get those flyers through me uh, or my company that I work for, um, that doesn't comply with our organization standards. And similarly down here, uh, creating that conflict of interest where the volunteer may personally and financially benefit from something um, using their authority as a volunteer inside our organization. And so we're trying to work through those conflicts. Unfortunately, a lot of these are kind of squishy areas. And so the best way to do it is just to report it up and we can take a look at it and make a determination on whether or not it conforms with, the, with our conflicts of interest. If it does, typically the goal is just to remove the conflict. So only in cases where discipline actually needs to be applied, is it applied? Most of the time, the request is, hey, we've identified a conflict here. Let's see if we can resolve the conflict of interest instead. These last two pieces are really for the volunteers on the call. Understanding that fraternity resources, specifically the money that you use from the fraternity in your capacity as a volunteer, must be used for volunteer purposes. So like on the Judiciary Committee, University of Miami, wonderful chapter, also wonderful location. Unless there's a reason for me to go down to Miami, I can't travel once a semester down there to get them a risk brief because that's not an appropriate use of fraternity funds. It is an enjoyable use of fraternity funds for me specifically, because um, I'm in Kansas City, it's like 30 degrees, but it is not an appropriate use. And that's what we're trying to head off here is making sure that money's being used uh, fru frugally, yeah, frugally and efficiently 
of the organization. Um, and you most certainly can't use that money to promote your own business or some sort of election that you'll be involved in uh, in the fraternity. And then the last piece is a requirement that volunteers have to report illegal conduct to the Judiciary Committee if it's reported to them. Before I move on, does anybody have any questions on these? Okay, so let's skip to these. And Melinda, I just wanna make sure I've been talking for 30 minutes. How much longer do I have? Okay, I'll keep going. And um, yeah, all right, sorry. so I'm doing so much. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, yeah, as long as me. You're good. So, um, this last piece here goes into disciplinary procedures. Uh, we've modified our disciplinary procedures for both student hearings and regional director hearings. Um, the entire document that we created, uh, we ran it through people, both on the conduct and the discipline side, who had no familiarity with our organization at all, to make sure that somebody who had never even heard of Alpha Kappa Psi could read it and say, I understand what we're trying to do here. If you're a student member, it's really important that A, whoever you've appointed to do your risk stuff and your conduct stuff, those individuals read this as part of their duties, right? At the beginning of the semester, hey, if you're the compliance director or the head of the JRB or, or who, whatever you decide, your first task is to read this thing and highlight it and understand what's going on. Because as, a, as the president or the vice president of your chapter, you're appointing those people as your advisors. So you wouldn't hire a lawyer. And then when you have a question, he says, well, I have to go back and you know, uh, read these basic law documents. Uh, you know, they might need to go back and reference the specific stuff in there, that's okay. Um, but they should have a general understanding of what our policies are. Uh, they don't have to recite it by memory, but at least know like where to look. Uh, for the student hearings, um, the biggest change that we have in the student hearings is that if your chapter is looking to conduct a disciplinary hearing, before you conduct a disciplinary hearing, you have to contact the Judiciary Committee. We're doing this because the, chat, the fraternity as a whole, uh, we're having a lot of problems with procedures being followed. When procedures aren't followed, two big issues happen. Well, three big issues happen. So the first issue is that we're violating members' rights. Um, and so it's easy for most of us who are on this call on a Sunday, right, to think, hey, if somebody is under a disciplinary process, they probably did the wrong thing. A lot of times they didn't do the wrong thing. And they were either, the, the accusation was kind of like off and didn't have all the details or they were falsely accused or the chapter might be discriminating in some way. Um, and if we don't follow our policies, then by the time we figure out that's happened, we've already violated this, these members' rights as part of an organization. Um, so the second piece is if no matter what, even if the member absolutely committed misconduct, if the chapter doesn't follow the policies, the member can appeal and it will most likely be reversed because the chapter failed to follow disciplinary processes. And we've seen this in the past. And that removes the fraternity's ability to discipline people who are conducting misconduct. And so we, we first stop in place because there are timelines involved. So when you contact us first, we let you know, hey, you got to give this person seven days before you can have a hearing with them, things like that. Um, and then the third piece uh, is most certainly on the legal side um, and the insurance side when it comes to making sure that our policies are being followed properly. If chapters are failing to follow our policies, and we don't do anything to those chapters, we are holding the bag for that. And so we put this in place to make sure that everybody's on the same page before we move down the path of disciplining a member. Um, I will tell you straight from the guy who makes these decisions, our preference is that students conduct disciplinary hearings. Uh, I very rarely say no to chapters on almost anything. If the chapter says, hey, we wanna do this disciplinary hearing, here's what happened and here's where we wanna go. Typically the answer is, you know, go forth and do it. Um, only in rare cases will we say no. And in those cases, I will always explain why. And typically the response is because this is something that our policies say the law has to get involved or the university has to get involved so you can't get involved in this. Um, that, that's like 90% of the answer. Um, another thing that's really important for members to understand is we need some sort of allegation before we can move forward. We can't work off of rumors. So the allegation doesn't have to come from the person who uh, had the incident happen to. So for instance, 
if a chat if a member witnesses a pledge being hazed the pledge doesn't necessarily have to report that they were hazed the member can report that um, they witnessed hazing occurring but what we can't do is have somebody send us a message that just says hey we heard that hazing was happening so we're going to bring this member up on charges we need somebody to say i was the person who reported this forward um, and that's really the those two things are the initial steps to getting discipline, discipline done inside our organization. Um, on the regional uh, director hearing. So regional directors can conduct hearing and generally this happens when the chapter is either unwilling or unable to conduct the hearing. Some quick examples, when the chapter president is accused of doing something wrong, typically we'll bring in uh, a regional director to do it. Um, when the chapter is so divided about something uh, or they don't think that they can conduct something impartially, they'll typically ask us to handle it and we'll ask the regional director to handle it. We use regional directors because they're more familiar with your chapter than I am. I generally know where most chapters are, uh, the ones who commit misconduct I'm more familiar with, um, but I don't know the culture of not only your chapter, but your university or even really your state or region. I don't really have a good grasp on that. Um, and it takes me a while to get spun up on what's going on when I do these investigations. So it's much easier for the regional director to be involved there. And then this last piece, the Judiciary Committee hearings, uh, we didn't modify, we just simplified the language. So it's a lot of talking to say, we wrote this document to be easy to, as easy as possible to read when it comes to discipline and following procedures. So I really encourage, um, you know, again, if you're dedicated enough to be on this call uh, on a Sunday, um, you're certainly probably following the camp of people who are going to read this anyway, but it's important that you push it on to those members to help them better understand what their requirements are as well. Um, and then can we go to the next slide? Okay, so before we do this, I just want to cover one more thing um, because it comes up all the time. So it's important to understand that members, uh, pledges are still members of our organization. So pledges can be disciplined in one of two ways, right? They can either be disciplined administratively, so those are pledge action plans followed by removal from the pledge process, or they can be disciplined the same way that we're doing it here. Typically, we ask that if a pledge has done something so bad that they need to be disciplined, they probably don't need to be part of the pledge process, but the option's available. Again, the easiest thing to do is just to reach out to us and say, this is what happened, what should I do? And we'll typically provide you with a very quick response. So this last thing here is just our implementation plan. The things that really matter to you are point three, four, five, and six. So point three down here, uh, we'll, we'll have a code of conduct posted in AKSI um, community, and that will allow members to agree to the code of conduct, or at least you know kind of give a prim on its face understanding uh, of what the code of conduct is. These next two pieces down here, when it talks about videos and additional training, um, Typically, when I get a risk, when the team gets a risk management allegation brought to them, I have to send this huge wordy email back that says, here's everything we're going to be doing next, blah, blah, blah. Instead, our education team, which is phenomenal, has made a whole bunch of separate videos to address these scenarios. So instead, I'll just provide you with a link and it'll be a two minute video of somebody talking, hopefully not me, but maybe me, and it will just say, hey, you know, these are generally the things that you're going to, you know, watch this video first. Here are the things that are probably going to answer your question. When you're done, shoot me an email back with follow on questions. And that will get the ball rolling on that discussion. It's the same thing for the regional directors and volunteers um, to help us better understand how to conduct our disciplinary hearings at our level. And then the last one is uh, we're looking to push out information when it comes to conduct out to chapters. Uh, the, the biggest thing is trends. So we work through this this kind of up and down cycle of nothing happening and then some thing happening we didn't predict. So, you know, when the Me Too movement came out, for instance, the fraternity obviously wasn't wasn't able to predict that, uh, but there were members who were involved in that. And so we want to push you information that says this is happening. Your chapter might be involved in it. And if so, here's what we think you should do to kind of to to, to work within that. Um, and then can you go to the next slide? Okay, so a whole bunch of information. I hope I wasn't talking too fast for you all. Uh, what I'd like is um, we have time for me to either answer questions or for volunteers to answer questions about this 
or any other risk management questions that you might have while, while we have a captive audience here. I have a, I have a question. How sure. about the uh, the chain of command? Can you can you clarify how these things should be brought up? Yeah. So uh, the way the conduct policy is written is any fraternity leader. So that means anybody who's been appointed to be a volunteer, uh, they have a requirement to report these things up to the judiciary committee. So that means as a student, you can essentially report this to any volunteer, and they're going to have a requirement to get it to us. The best best method to do this is through your regional director, section director, or chapter advisor. Those are the easiest people to get in touch with. It's also important to understand that you are the way the management and you know what. I don't have an expectation that everybody understands the hierarchy, but your management team, uh, those, those directors and advisors, they're kind of the volunteer structure that sits above you. They are separate from the Judiciary Committee and they have different responsibilities. Your chapter advisor's responsibility is to advocate for you in many cases. So in many cases, it benefits you to tell your chapter advisor because when I interface with them, their job isn't to say, look at this chapter that just messed up. Their job is to say, here's an incident and here's what I think you should be doing about it. Um, and and in, I, will, I will say this with no data to back it up, but in most cases when chapter advisors are involved, the process is much smoother on the chapter when an incident has happened, either at the chapter level or the individual level, because we know we have somebody trusted there that we can work with. Other questions? Okay. I have a question, uh, Sarah. Go ahead. Uh, um, so say for instance, like um, for chapter events, um, again, I'm part of the alumni chapter. Mm -hmm. um, so for collegiate uh, chapters, say for instance that if they don't want an alumni at an event, do they have to explain the reason why or how does that work? No, so they don't need to explain the reason why. Um, and that regional director is kind of the arbiter. So, you know, I can't look into the future, but I can make predictions on what will happen. I would say a majority of time, chapters will probably do the right thing and they will prohibit alumni who are disruptive from attending events. Sometimes, um, chapters will probably prohibit alumni for the wrong reasons. Uh, and that's where the regional director gets involved because since the alumni is receiving the message, they can contact that regional director back and ask questions like, why is this happening? Or this is what I think is happening. And that regional director can serve as the arbiter to kind of resolve that situation. It is, it's important for alumni to understand that once you leave the chapter, your role shifts into being more of an advisor and whereas we really want alumni to be involved, it's also, we want the chapters to be able to govern themselves. And so if the chapters you know, say, hey, we don't really want your advice when it comes to this, uh, we have to find a way to respect that uh, while still making sure our volunteers aren't being ostracized or our alumni aren't being ostracized. So it's a tough process, but those regional directors, they're kind of the, the middle ground to resolve that. Thank you. Yep. I have, uh, I have a couple quick questions, hopefully. Um, First is um, the code of conduct form. Uh, you briefly mentioned uh, that we should uh, kind of get everyone to read that and sign off that they read that. Uh, would that be everyone in the chapter? I'm gonna have to defer that question to a member of the staff. I think it's, um, in, in this, um, that will be in the community. It's not there yet, just so you know, but you should go over the code of conduct with all members um, at least once a semester. And that's why in the implementation, we're going to try to really get code of conduct. It's not like something that you just look at once and then like this we want in everyday life, um, you know, for you to always be thinking of your behavior and, and your conduct as an AKSI member. So uh, yes, I, everyone should look at this, at least understand, you know, the basics of the code of conduct. Yes. And if I can just, another thing I want to share is 
we want to get away from using the terms risk management. I mean, these are code of conduct, conduct policies. So um, that's another thing we're going to be putting uh, in different places because uh, that's like a shift. I think a lot of people think risk management policies, these are conduct policies moving forward. So Greg, I would definitely look for a post that's gonna come out on the community that would better describe um, what we're gonna do with this once once we've got everything posted up there. And you had another question? Yeah, all right, so to clarify that, at least at the moment, the best thing we could do is uh, maybe discuss the code of conduct at a chapter meeting, but it might not be the best scenario to mail it out to, or email it to everyone and say, read this and sign that you read it. Uh, or, or are we going to wait on that because you're rolling out more paperwork or what's, what's the thought on that? Yeah. So my recommendation would be that, um, it gets emailed out to the members to say, hey, here is the code of conduct. And at the minimum, the chapter leadership makes sure that the individuals who are involved in the conduct process, uh, like conduct enforcement, those members are directed to read that. Um, and then what I would do is probably wait until the end of the semester for guidance to come out from the fraternity. And beginning next semester, we'll probably be able to, we'll have everything ironed out so you can do formal trainings, uh, if not this semester. All right, that sounds good. Um, the other question I had regarded around alumni, um, you hit on this a little bit. Uh, if we had a concern about uh, alumni getting involved with current actions of the fraternity, is that something that you know we just have to deal with or do we talk about that with someone or what's the, what's the mindset there? Just for a case example. We're not dealing with this right now as a chapter. I'm just wondering going forward. Sure. So we deal with this all the time. Um, and, you know, the answer is reach out to us so we can we can uh, help resolve it at the Judiciary Committee level. Um, you know, th this ranges from a lot of, I, can, I have plenty of stories on where it ranges from, but, you know, this ranges from on, on one side, members showing up intoxicated to events and harassing members. You know, that's something that's very easy for us to deal with. Um, but then there's this other side of that alumni that sits in the back of the room all the time and is giving passive guidance to the chapter and the volu volunteers or members are seeing that that guidance is really pushing them in the wrong direction. Um, and so we can still hand handle that at the JC level. We can work with uh, Thomas and Jackie to have a direct interaction with that member and, or that volunteer or alumni and say, hey, this is kind of what we're seeing. Um, or we can just move down the path saying, hey, we think you probably need a semester off to get this chapter some space. Uh, so the JC is a great stop for that. I will say that Jackie, um, our executive vice president, she's also a fantastic stop. Thomas, I might be wrong on this. But my understanding is she's, is she still typically involved in, in alumni type affairs? Yeah, so Jackie, our uh, executive vice president, is also a great stop to just ask, hey, kind of where, where should we move forward next with this? Uh, okay, so yeah, if Greg, if that doesn't answer your question, go ahead and let me know. Uh, otherwise, does anybody else have questions? Um, With uh, code of conduct at, for the alumni chapters, uh, how did, how would you recommend we go about it? with both with our executive board and with our members. Yeah, so this and is gonna be- like, You know, to read over it, sign it, because, you know, hypothetically, what if there was a situation where uh, alumni brother is like, I'm, I'm not signing this and, you know, getting very defensive, like, I don't have to sign this. I already know what I should and should not be doing. And then it comes into a situation where we're like, okay, well, in order for you to come to our events, this would be a form you would be required to sign just so that you understand the expectations of what needs to be followed. Yeah, so uh, really important to understand. That's a great question. Um, these policies are binding on members whether or not they agree to them or sign them. And so there doesn't need to be a requirement for your chapter that people sign this to participate. This is as of when it was passed like a week ago, this is binding on everybody in this room and everybody at every single chapter event. 
So our goal, especially as fraternity leaders, is to inform people, right? When the law changes, the law is in effect. Somebody just has a requirement to say, here's the law. And then, and that's just sending them the code of conduct. But there's also an expectation that as leaders, we go a little bit further and say, hey, you know, we all knew this existed, but we just want to make sure everybody's aware that these other things are in effect. This should not come as a surprise to anybody. None of all of these things are, um, you know, when, when we talk about code of conduct, people say, you know, this is, these seem like obvious policies. And they are, they just need to be codified better explained. Um, so, uh, you know, again, refusal to sign, not something we entertain in the organization. Uh, the policies are in place and, and every member is required to follow them. So uh, I, I'm happy to take more questions. I will stay on this call uh, as long as you all have questions. Um, so, you know, what I'll do is I'll ask first, uh, does anybody else have any more questions that might benefit the group? I, I, most certainly, if I didn't clarify something or I left something out, please ask. Make sure everybody uh, gets that information. Hey, Christian. Uh, there's one in the chat. Um, if we are still in our pledge education process, should we implement this into uh, Rich Brotherhood now, or will pledge education materials come out next semester? Yes, that is a great question, and I am certainly going to defer to the staff on that one. Uh, they, they're a little more. A little better at answering that than I. Uh, we are, our goal is to have it, uh, we're modifying the learning plan, Bridge Brotherhood and that information. But this semester, if you're in the middle of your uh, pledge program, go over the code of conduct, like do that during one of your um, sessions. So that's our goal is uh, we're working through, you know, updating the learning plans and all the documents within the knowledge base. So yes, if you're still in the pledge program and the education part, please you know, take a meeting and go over the, the code of conduct. And that's in the knowledge base and the pledges are in the community as soon as they're reported so they can go in there and, and access it too. Other questions? Yeah, before everybody uh, hangs up on this. I just want to give a plug at the end of this. So the Judiciary Committee is, consists of all volunteers. Um, if you are a member who is interested in the conduct policies uh, or procedures or discipline, especially if you're a chapter leader who has dealt with discipline problems in your chapter before uh, and you're looking to contribute back after you leave your chapter, we always have availability to help us conduct investigations. Uh, usually my plug is that we fly you to great places. That's a little difficult in COVID-19, but we do a lot of in-person investigations and the, the fraternity does that, uh, pays for that. So um, most certainly we can get your expertise you might be experiencing in your chapter. We can round it out with some fraternity experience. Then we can send you to other chapters so you can kind of help them out too. So if that's something you're interested in, please don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, we love having more people on the team, either on the JC or just occasionally being tagged to uh, help us conduct investigations. And so what I'll do is, uh, at this point, um, Melinda or Thomas, do you all have anything else you want to put out? Um, I just want to thank. Oh, oh I'm oh, sorry. I just want to thank you, Christian, um, for this presentation. Um, I don't know if all of you know, like this is the second time he's done it, so I really appreciate it. Appreciate all the work you've done on this. Um, we're really, um, you know, excited to get this out and get all these, the training and um, the different things. So thank you again, Christian. I really Absolutely. appreciate it. I just want to thank everyone for attending tonight. Um, you know, this is kind of part of what we did at President's Academy in regards to the resolution. And one of the discussions uh, a group of presidents had with Steve and I was, concerns about alumni coming to events. So that kind of piece was being sure that it was implemented as part of this code of conduct. Code of conduct. So, um, you know, we are here to listen and help shape uh, the code of conduct for AKSI. Um, so thank you again for everyone's input, uh, for being here to listen and share your thoughts and things like that. So uh, we will be pushing out more of this. Um, so this is not the last time you will be hearing about this, um, but, more information, uh, the more we can share with our members, uh, the better we are off as an organization. 
the code conduct does not change because we are virtual. This happens in, even in the virtual environment. So I uh, appreciate everyone uh, for joining tonight. Thank you, Christian, uh, for taking the time to share this with us and Melinda and team uh, to ensure that we get this out to our members.